Hello, and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 102. I am recording this episode just a couple of days before Christmas. I hope that you are enjoying getting all your preparations together and I think I'm ready. (laughs) Pretty sure I am. And we are absolutely looking forward to a Christmas that includes a grandson this year. And um, of course, all my daughters and my son in law and my uncle and everybody will be coming over for Christmas and doing dinner and all that kind of thing. So looking forward to it. I hope that you are having a wonderful week as well. But wanted to make sure I got this uh, episode out since, of course, we missed the last one when I was down sick. But as you can tell, my voice is finally coming back. So I'm very happy to be able to be talking to you today. First of all, I wanted to start off with the news and say that this news segment is going to be a lot of genealogy gems news because we've got a lot of stuff going on around here that's new. First of all, I am very excited to say that I have been asked to speak at the Who Do You Think You Are live conference in London on Sunday, February 27th of 2011. I know that I have a lot of listeners out there in the UK, and I am really looking forward to meeting some of you guys. I I hope that you'll be attending. I'm very excited. I've, I've heard amazing things about this conference, and it's just really cool to be able to be a part of it. If you're planning on attending, you can use the promotional code SOG2425 to purchase two tickets at the discounted rate. Um, This is here of two tickets for £25. So I think that is the current coupon code promotional uh, rate that they've got going on. But you can learn more about that at the Who Do You Think You Are live website. I'll have a link for you in the show notes. I'm also very happy to announce several more speaking engagements that I've got scheduled for 2011. Um, Let's see here. First coming up is going to be the Mesa Family History Expo, January 21st and 22nd of 2011 at the Mesa Convention Center, not too far from Phoenix. And of course, that's put on by Family History Expos at fhexpos.com. And uh, I'll have a link specifically to the Mesa Expo. Uh, It's a fun one. They've been doing this one for several years. And uh, not only will I be speaking there and we'll have a booth and um, let's see, my daughter Vienna is going to be coming with me, but I'm also going to be the keynote speaker. Very excited about that. Very nice to be asked. On January 29th, I will be heading over to Whittier, California, down in Southern California, doing the 28th annual all-day seminar, which is going to be Google for Genealogy, and that's at the Whittier Area Genealogical Society. You can get more information on that at C-A-G-E-N-W-E-B dot com slash K-R slash WAGS, which stands for Whittier Area Genealogical Society, slash seminar dot HTML. I am also going to be giving several presentations for the first time at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference being held in Columbus, Ohio, March 31st through April 2nd of 2011. I know we've got lots of listeners out there in the Ohio area. Would love to see you there. Um, To learn more about that, head over to OGS.org slash conference 2011 slash index.php. And then in April, I will be giving several presentations over at the Alberta Genealogical Society Conference in Edmonton, Canada. That's going to be on April 16th and 17th. Um, For more information on the Alberta Genealogical Society Conference, head on over to agsconference2011.blogspot.com. And I am very happy to be able to announce, finally, that I will be returning to the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree in Burbank, California on June 10th through the 12th. That's 2011. We'll once again be doing a live podcast. And I know we're going to have a much better sound system for recording this time than we did last year. We've got that all figured out. And in addition to, of course, giving several presentations, doing the live podcast, uh, Lacey's going to be there with me. We'll be doing the booth in the exhibit hall. It's just a grand time. If you have any opportunity to get down to Southern California, um, that is a worthwhile conference to head to. And by the first 2011 conference in Mesa at the Family History Expo, I am very happy to say that we are going to have my brand new book available. Gosh, I have been working on this one for so long, and I can't wait for it to be published in January of 2011. 
I'll have more about that in the next few podcasts. But let me just say that many, many of you have asked me to do this book, a very comprehensive book on using Google for genealogy. And it's wonderful to finally be able to tell you that it's on the way. So the book is called The Genealogist's Google Toolbox. And this puppy is packed with everything Google that you can imagine. You're not only going to learn about the wide range of Google tools that are available, but you're also going to have a step by step reference slash workbook to work alongside with you every step of the way showing you how to use all these different free tools to further your family history research. There's a great comprehensive table of contents course in the front. Uh, That's really super easy to find what you need, but also we're going to have what I call the how to index in the back. So when you run up against a question, you know, how do I search something specifically in a certain time period? Or how do I embed a photograph in my Google Earth map? Or how do I translate the entire page of German text from a book that I find in Google Books? You can just turn to the back. And there in the back of the book, you're going to find in the how to section, the page number for every single set of how to instructions that we have in the book. And there are loads of them. It's a very fun, interactive reading. And it's a book that you're just going to want to have right there by your computer monitor every day. um, Because I'm hoping that it's really going to be a very usable workbook. So stay tuned for the big announcement on the exact publish date. But that is coming. And speaking of speaking engagements, of course, if you would like to book me to speak at your society or conference, it's real easy to do. Just go to genealogygems.com and click the seminars link in the main menu, which will take you to a list of available presentations that I have there. Um, You'll find my complete bio and for more information, or if you want to request that booking, email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Would love to come out and see you. Okay, well, next up, you have probably already heard, but just in case, I want you to know that the new Genealogy Gems podcast companion app for the Android is now available in the Android marketplace. This is something I know that many of you have asked for, and I can't believe that we already got it done. Dick Eastman, thank you, Dick, mentioned it in his newsletter. Appreciate the shout out on that. And I really think that mobile technology is really the wave of the future. Uh, Everybody's talking about it. So I am very thrilled to be a part of it. I'll have a link to an app website where you can get the app because um, actually what I've heard is the Android Marketplace website does not necessarily have the full directory of apps that are available yet. They're still working on that. The easiest way for you to find the app is just to do a search by the title Genealogy Gems. You can do that if you have the Marketplace on your phone or you can go to a site called appbrain.com. The app is compatible with OS 1.6 or later. And like the iPhone app, it has several advantages. You can listen to the show in the background as you're doing other things on the phone, which from what I hear from people is just super convenient. And of course, you'll have access to the bonus content. That's the real bonus of the app, if you will. Uh, The bonus content is videos and audio and images and documents and things that we publish that go along with the episode and they're exclusively available through the apps. And of course, it also gives you lots of ways to connect with the show through website links, email and voicemail. Premium member Mary Lore wrote in right after the app launched, and she says the Genealogy Gems podcast app is now on my Droid phone. It was very easy to download and install, and it works like a charm. Best $2.99 I've spent in a long time. Thanks for making it available. So check it out. If you have an Android phone uh, like Mary does, and for those of you, of course, with the iPhone or the iPod iTouch or an iPad, uh, we've got you covered with all the different apps that we have, both in the Apple Store and in the Android Marketplace. And I've got something for everyone. The new podcast media player on the show notes page. Okay, that's in, anybody can use this. To get to the show notes, you go to genealogygems.com. You just click the podcast icon that you see there on the home page, and it's going to take you to the blog show notes for the podcast. The most recent episode, of course, is at the top, and then you can just scroll down to see the past episodes. Well, I've always had a media player in the right-hand column of that blog, (laughs) but it's kind of confusing because it always shows you the most recent episode, no matter which episode's show notes you're actually looking at. 
So I'm now adding a media player for each episode that I publish, and that will be in the show notes for that particular episode. It plays that episode. So now, no matter which of the more recent episodes, probably I went back about a dozen episodes and added in the uh, unique media players. And of course, they'll be in all the future ones as well. So now it's even easier to listen while you look at the show notes. And finally, we just published premium episode number 60. Got lots of great information for you, premium members there in episode 60. We've got uh, answers to how to kind of coordinate the use of ancestry trees online, along with using Roots Magic on your own computer and how to move the data around. We also talk about the Google phone book, which has recently gone away and kind of talk about some of the behind the scenes on that. And then our key gem for the episode is rethinking the journal. You might have thought about journaling in the past. It can be very daunting because we tend to think of it as being something we've got to write down every day, but not so. I want to kind of think outside the box and give you a new way to think about doing journaling, not only for yourself, but for your future descendants. And I've got 10 journal topics for you to write about that I think maybe you haven't um, thought about before, but I think would be wonderful topics, not only for you to write about, but for others down the road, down the generations to read about. So that's all in premium episode number 60. And I have included, just for the holidays, a wonderful song from my friends, Venice. They sing the family tree song, and oh boy, do they have a gorgeous Christmas album out. And so we round out the show with a a wonderful tune from that CD. So, of course, to become a premium member, all you have to do is head over to genealogygems.com. And if you do that before December 26th of 2010, you can get 30% off. This is one of the rare times we ever run a sale on the premium membership. If you put in the coupon code 30 new year, you will get 30% off for the year. And if you already have a premium membership, you can actually add on an additional year if you want to. So if you want to extend it out, or if it's going to come up for renewal pretty soon, this is a great way to get the savings right now while it's available. So it's 30 new year when you sign up at Uh, genealogygems.com. Okay, well, that's it. I told you there was lots of genealogy gems news for you. And next, I want to hear your news and your questions. And we'll do that over at the mailbox. My first email here in the mailbox is from Lee Van Bergen, who writes, After a bit of procrastination, my homepage is now iGoogle, and of course, the Genealogy Gems gadget is on it. My question is, why is the newest podcast listed in the gadget as number 81? I know you have 101 podcast episodes. Shouldn't that be the top one? Thanks for any help you can give. Well, Lee, this is a great question, and you are absolutely right, and I'm sure a couple of others of you out there have noticed this as well. The Genealogy Gems podcast gadget that is listed in the gadget directory at Google was the first one that I created. And right around episode number 81, we changed the podcast feed, the information, how we send it to the gadget, how we put it out there to the uh, iTunes. And that's because of some changes the uh, website made that hosts my podcast, the, uh, what do you call it, the server, I guess, the folks who have the server. Unfortunately, Google doesn't provide a way for people to update the gadgets that they create and we, that we add to the directory. So when we changed that podcast feed after episode 81, the gadget no longer updated. It wasn't getting the same information through the feed. And I couldn't change the feed, unfortunately. However, there isn't a really super easy solution to this. Go ahead and just delete the existing gadget from iGoogle. And then what you want to do is go over to genealogygems.com, look over in the right-hand blue column, and click the plus Google button. It's a little button there in the right-hand column. On the next page, you will want to click, um, it goes to the Google page, and you will click the Add to Google Home Page button. It's a blue button. And now you will automatically, if you go back to your iGoogle page, you will have the most current Genealogy Gems gadget there on your iGoogle page. And of course, it'll show the most current episode, the podcast episode. So that is a super quick and easy way to do it. 
There's another way to do this, too. If you click the podcast icon that you find there on the homepage of my website, it takes you, of course, as I mentioned, to the show notes page, which is the podcast blog page. All you need to do is copy the website address, the URL address for that page, which is genealogygemspodcast.com. And then go to iGoogle, click add stuff, the link over there on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side of the iGoogle directory, the add stuff page, click the add feed or gadget link, and then just paste the entire URL address for the podcast into the box and click the add button. And again, you'll instantly have that Genealogy Gems podcast gadget on your iGoogle page. And in fact, This process can be used for any RSS feed for any blog that you enjoy. So uh, if there are other genealogy blogs that you listen to, and they don't have their own gadget in the directory, all you need to do is follow these steps and you can create gadgets right there on your iGoogle homepage. So thank you very much, Lee. It's a great question. And I hope that lots of you use this technique to uh, get the updated version of the gadget. Next up, I have an email here from Amber Pratt, who wants to share a great website that she recently came across. She writes, Hi, Lisa, I found your podcast back in August of this year and ever since have listened to all the episodes of both Genealogy Gems free podcast and all the ones that you did for Family History Genealogy Made Easy. I wanted to let you know about a useful site I discovered this morning. My maternal grandmother's family is from Missouri, and for the longest time, I wasn't able to find the names of her grandfather's parents. Last night, I was searching Google for the Lawrence County, Missouri genealogy and found a link from www.lawrencecountymo.com that led me to sos.mo.gov slash archives slash resources slash death certificates. And it says, I have not only found my grandmother's grandparents' death certificates on her father's side, I have finally, after years and years of searching, found the names of her grandfather's parents and confirmed the names of her grandmother's parents. I smashed a brick wall to pieces this morning, and it felt awesome. I just thought if anyone else had family in Missouri that had died between 1910 and 1959, they might find the above site a treasure trove of information as I have. Thanks for keeping up the podcast. And I can't wait to listen to the next episodes of both the free and the premium versions. And Amber also has her own genealogy blog. Congratulations on not only breaking through the brick wall, but getting this genealogy blog going. It's called Tackling Brick Walls, One Brick at a Time. Very appropriate. Uh, Has a very cool background there on the blog. And she primarily uses the blog to record her findings about her research. So uh, you can check those out at mygenresearch.blogspot.com. Thanks for writing, Amber. That's a great tip. And listener Shelly Johnson has written in for some advice. She writes, I enjoy your podcast very much. I have a situation where I could really use some genealogical advice. I have been doing my mother's genealogy for about 30 years, and we have a relative that we just cannot find out what happened to her. Her name is Ethel May Faisenbaker. She married a Thomas William Murphy in Mineral County, West Virginia on December 23rd of 1907. She had a daughter in May 1909 in Allegheny County, Maryland. She then disappears from the records. Family lore is that she had died in some sort of accident. Her widowed husband remarries in October of 1910. The grandparents came and took the first child, and she lived with them until she got married. Thomas remarries and has another daughter. I have checked death records for both Maryland and West Virginia. I have even tried reading the newspapers to find an obituary. Is there anything else that you can suggest that I can do to solve this mystery? Thank you, Shelley Johnson. Well, without a lot of specifics to work on, um, I can try and give you a couple of suggestions, kind of approaches that I would take. Um, You know, my first instinct would be to see if there is a state census record available. Uh, If you're lucky, you might be able to find a 1905 state census just to get a little more information about her family before her death. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like there is a Maryland state census at that time in 1905. 
I'll have a link in the show notes to the Family Search wiki page for the Maryland census records where uh, they confirm that there is not a state census that I'm aware of or that is listed there on the page. According to their list, state census records just aren't available. So you can turn your attention to state and county death records in Maryland, since that's the last place that she lived. So back again to the Family Search Wiki to get an overview of what kind of might be available since I don't have experience searching in Maryland. Uh, I went to the Family Search Wiki and I found a, a main page that gave me a link to the Maryland death records that they know that they have a catalog there. And it has a link to the 1910 through 1951 death index at the Maryland State Archives website. I don't know if you've already checked this out, but it looked very interesting. Statewide death records began in Maryland back in 1898. And interestingly, while there is no Ethel May Murphy or Ethel Murphy or May Murphy, as you go through this death index there uh, and on this link, I did notice that the surname Murray immediately follows Murphy in these online card indexes. And sure enough, as I pursued that, I went and kind of started going through the Murrays thinking, well, maybe somebody just didn't hear it right or spell it right. I found a card for Ethel May Murray, who died January 30th of 1908, about what, eight months prior to when you had the date on the daughter. And that was in Talbot County, Maryland. Now, it may be a very big long shot, but depending on how reliable your birth information is about Ethel's daughter, this might be a record worth taking a closer look at. Maybe it was just written out wrong or the date, you know, was tagged on wrong. Who knows? But very interesting that there is an Ethel May Murray within less than a year of the date that you have. And you can order that record right online from the Maryland State Archives. I'll have a link for you in the show notes. So those are just a couple of things that I would do to pursue. Certainly, newspapers are always things I go for trying to look for obituaries, not just for the person, but for the other people they were related to, where then the obituary might make mention of where that person is or if they're already deceased. I would also recommend doing some snooping around the Maryland Library's website. Uh, you can find that at sailor, S-A-I-L-O-R dot L-I-B dot M-D dot U-S. Look up Maryland topics and, and see what you might be able to find there. And also, of course, the Archives of Maryland online at aomol.net. And of course, if any of you listening have some good tips for Shelley, how she might track down this early 20th century death record uh, for somebody in the state of Maryland, or, you know, maybe she went back to West Virginia, who knows, but it sounds like maybe Maryland, definitely send me an email and we will pass that on to Shelly. Uh, you can reach me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Good luck, Shelly. And on Facebook, I got a post from Deborah. She says, what would you think of citing the siblings of a direct ancestor by simply referencing slash referring readers to the parents' citations? My grandmother was one of 12 children. While I won't be delving a whole lot into the other 11 siblings, I still want people to learn where I got my information. For example, the 1900 U.S. census records. Would it be proper to note for birth year something to the effect of, per the 1900 U.S. census records, see parent citations, and put the full citation in the parent's vital records information? This would speed up things a lot. <laughs> Laughing out loud, she says. If this is not proper, I will cite properly. Thanks for your guidance and congratulations on 100 episodes. I have enjoyed them all. Well, Deborah, I fully understand your idea here. I do. However, resist the temptation. It can make sense now, but down the road, you might want to, you know, print out a section of your database. Maybe you're going to print out a family group or an individual worksheet at someone's request or to take with you on a research trip. Then you realize, oh, this source is referring to another source that I don't have the printout. I don't have the record. You know, properly sourcing each person as you go will serve you and your research very well down the future. I do it. I, and actually, after a while, if you, you can do some cutting and pasting, it can go pretty quickly. But hopefully the software that you use allows for real easy copying or maybe one time source creation that then you attach that source to the individual people. 
So thank you very much for listening. Hang in there and get your sources cited and appreciate your congratulations. Thanks. And here we have a new genealogy blogger. Premium member Kevin sent me an email with the subject line, OK, I caved. So I found that one a bit intriguing. He says, you keep telling people to start a blog. Well, I've been able to resist, but only up to this point. And he has created a new blog. Now I'm going to read out the address here. It's a little different. It says, the S-C-R-Y-P-T 3141.wordpress.com. I'll have that for you in the show notes. He continues on, we'll see where it goes, I guess. Easier to read than to write. Finally, I listened to the podcast from the PI from Florida. Really enjoyed that one. Thanks. Kevin Boyles. Well, Kevin has an excellent blog title, I think, for his blog. It's Genealogical Masonry, because it's all about brick walls now. <laughs> That's a great title. Um, gosh, maybe you can get genealogicalmasonry.com and you could redirect that blog address to that address, because that would be really easy to uh, share with people. But great job, Kevin. Keep going. It's worth it. And we have a happy listener here who got in touch with me. Pat says, I have been listening to your podcast now on my daily walks around parks and cemeteries for several months now. Love them. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Decided it was time to upgrade and learn more. Massachusetts in the winter will probably be too cold to walk and listen for me. So maybe it's off to computer listening instead. Great months for learning new things are ahead with the snow. And isn't that the case? It really is an opportunity, I think. Uh, after the holidays get past and the cold weather's really setting in, gosh, that's the time to hunker down and catch up on your listening, on your reading, on your research. Don't you love it? I think February through March are great. I used to kind of dread them because they were always very quiet months. But now it's like, oh, this is my time to really dig in. So uh, great. We'll be digging in with you there, Pat. Thank you very much for writing. And thanks to all of you for writing. Wonderful to hear from you. Coming up next, we're going to hear about Roots Magic. And then we're going to be into another gem. This one is an interview with an old friend. And I am sure you'll recognize him. That's coming up next. Roots Magic 4 has been completely rewritten and is now even more powerful and makes building your family tree easier than ever. I love it. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer, quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard, create customized reports, and best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with the Roots Magic to go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history, publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even generate websites automatically from your data. To download your risk free trial of Roots Magic 4, head to rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. episode number 86, we had on the show Kendall Wilcox. He's the executive producer for The Generations Project. That is a genealogy TV show that explores the genealogy of everyday folks, and it's on BYU TV. Well, they had a very successful first season last year, and they are ramping up for a new season. Starting in January of 2011, season two of The Generations Project is going to be coming to our televisions, and here to tell us all about it is our old friend, Kendall Wilcox. Welcome back to the show, Kendall. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. 
we're very happy to have you back. You have been a busy guy <laughs> since the last time we talked. Um, yeah. I was checking out the website. Oh, my gosh, that has developed so much. And I can imagine the effort that you're putting into to season two. But um, before we jump into the Generations Project, let's just talk a little bit um, about genealogy in general, because, of course, that's kind of at the core of your show. Um, I was kind of curious, you know, in the last few years, it seems like family history is has really just become such a hot topic. And you guys are right in the middle of all that. Why do you think that is now? Why do you think that's the case? That is the gazillion dollar question. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I, I'm not sure. I mean, with, with the work that we've been doing with, with individuals on the show, there's something about sort of the, the experience of connecting to uh, past human beings who have some sort of genealogical or genetic connection to you that, that impacts your life in a way that um, it's so hard for people to understand before they do it. But once they do, it just is so life-changing. I, I don't know. I, word of mouth is getting out that, hey, this, this thing isn't um, – sort of all dusty old books and sepia tone photographs, it's, it's it has some relevance to my life today. Um, and, you know, I, I really don't know. Oh, I think that's a great point, because that's what the show seems to illustrate so well. And then, of course, we have social media now, and we have all of these ways that people can tell each other how cool this is. Exactly. Uh, and that's, that's uh, the other component is the technology component to it, that, that uh, there's so much information online now as, as far as how to learn how to, to do it properly and so many different resources to help you do it and communicate with others uh, through the social networking, through, you know, online technologies that it's, in a sense, become easier um, or at least more available. So a combination of, a, a, you know, a confluence of all of those factors, I guess. Right. What kind of feedback did you get from viewers from season one? You know, was there a big difference between the response from genealogists and non-genealogists in their reaction to the show? Uh, yeah, definitely. From I would say, you know, from the, the gen genealogists, they said, oh, we love it. Thank you so much in terms of sort of, it was almost a, an expression of uh, validation of, of all the work that they've done for years when they've, they've sort of, they've, they've caught the bug years ago. And, um, and understand what difference it can make in, in, in their lives and also those that, for whom they search. But, uh, and so it was sort of a, a thank you so much for, for the validation mm -hmm. um, and for bringing it to a, a, an even wider audience. Um, but then for, for the non-genealogist, it, it was definitely the, huh, who, who knew factor? Yeah. Who knew it was so interesting and so invigorating and could actually – change the way I think about myself in some deep, profound ways. Um, so very different. And then also, uh, typically, you know, from, from genealogists, they would say, thank you, thank you, this is so great, but I want to find out more of your research methodologies. I want to see how you got to that, that conclusion. And, of course, it, we, we knew that going in, that that would be sort of the, um, sort of the internal tug of war in terms of how we produce the shows, because as a TV show, our obligation is first to entertain and, and then inform. And so when push comes to shove, you know, we, we, we may not portray all the ins and outs and the nitty gritty of our research methodology, but more just the results and the sort of story impact that they have. And so for the, from the non-genealogists, they say, this is great. You know, I, it looks so easy. <laughs> it's just, it's just yeah. easy. So we, we are, we are aware that um, sometimes we may be, you know, sort of unintentionally, but short, short changing the genealogists out there, as we know, takes hours and hours and months to find just this one little thing, which on the show may literally just appear for the person on a computer screen because we've, we've done all the work to put it there. Um, so those are some of the general reactions on both sides of the fence. Exactly. I, I know that, gosh, after we spoke, I think I did a, a blog post kind of about the genealogy shows in general on television, and I was saying... I was hearing some of those same kind of responses from genealogists uh, who were chatting on Facebook and that type of thing and saying, oh, they made it look too easy. And I remember kind of writing and saying, you know, the thing is, you wouldn't want a one hour TV show to be how we teach people methodology. <laughs> I mean, that can't happen. But it seemed to me what you really accomplished with the Generations Project is that you somehow put into a, a story form 
what it is that we're all so passionate about. You know, because sometimes we get asked, you know, why are you into this? What are you doing? And it's a difficult thing to articulate. And yet you kind of just put it on the screen and someone can watch that and go, like you said, oh, I get that. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that is your reaction because obviously, yeah, that is what we're trying to portray is that, again, as a television show, it, it's our obligation to entertain through story and engage individuals because we all love to be engaged by, you know, stories and the characters in those stories and to be put in their place. Uh, and so hopefully, yeah, our number one objective was to capture those moments of sort of life-changing sort of shifts in a sense of identity, who I am, what, who and what I've come from, how that might impact my future. And also going into it, we, we did know, we were very conscious of the fact of the ubiquity of the how-to components on the Internet, that because of the occurrence of the Internet uh, and huge shifts in, you know, just the last 10 years in terms of availability of the how-to uh, technology, that we just thought, well, there's no, no need to put that on TV. As soon as we inspire individuals by showing them what a difference it can make, showing them how fun an adventure on the hunt for information can be and how it can change their life, once we've inspired them through that, they will can't help them, themselves but go to the Internet, and that now they're inspired to, to do the work, to learn how to do it properly and start asking sort of the deeper questions about how to do it. So that was our, our thinking going into it. Well, and I can tell that because, boy, you look at your website now from when you first launched, and you are offering them so many resources to continue the journey themselves. Tell us about what's new at the website. Well, yeah, on the website, we we do offer um, different resources in terms of speaking to genealogists, linking over to different resources. And actually, I should say that um, the current website as people will find it, you know, uh, when they even, even I think when they find this podcast uh, or listen to it, will be changing. It will be changing um, pretty soon in 2011. A couple months into 2011, we'll launch uh, a new, uh, uh, you know, sort of Generations Project website 2.0 that will, will sh- shift entirely and actually will be uh, more in a format of a blog experience because many of the major... Uh, websites are, are sort of moving over into that blog format because that interface is how most people are becoming most familiar and it's the easiest interface uh, and it, for interaction. And so it'll be a blog format with lots of how-tos, but they'll be, you know, sort of archived just like on your, on your website under different topic matters. They'll be tagged by different subjects. So it'll actually allow us to do a lot more in a more streamlined format. So that's coming in um, early 2011. And will that still include the videos? It will. It, it, absolutely, it will. But even within, um, with, 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 in conjunction with those videos, uh, we'll actually go through it and allow for some breaks within watching. You can watch, have the option of watching the entire video, you know, the entire episode, or you can also watch it in chunks, in sections, and then in between those sections, our bloggers will insert a little bit more of the behind-the-scenes how-to how this moment came into being, uh, provide some links that we utilized during the, the creation of the episode, um, you know, and again, some behind-the-scenes stories and so on. And then you can you know, finish reading that paragraph, click away if you want to, and go searching in the way that we did, or go ahead and watch the next section of the episode, and then again, read some of the behind-the-scenes and the how-to and find hyperlinks to different uh, resources uh, in, in connection to that, that, that section that, that you just watched. It will also allow us to uh, more quickly and directly follow up and continue the conversations that are initiated on the television show. Uh, our host, Lisa, is continuously, especially in season two, continuously um, inviting viewers to you know, continue following the conversation online, hear updates from the individuals to see how much further they've dug into their family history, which we have pushed them heavily to do and uh, offered all of our resources to them as a support system to them. And so they, you know, we actually give them some specific homework and challenges to go down certain lines that we didn't have time to do on our show, but that, of course, are, are um, full of, you know, juicy tidbits and information that would be uh, relevant to them. And, of course, we offer our genealogists and our historians uh, time 
uh, just a phone call away to help them, you know, push further along. And then we, in turn, ask that of them in exchange for that resource to share with us their process. And then our, uh, you know, Mary on our blog updates each of those pages with new information continuously. Wow, so the story doesn't end when the episode ends. We sure hope not. <laughs> That's great. Well, it sounds like, so your website could easily be used by somebody who's brand new to family history, and yet you're going to have, it sounds like, some more in-depth so that the the people who are already into their genealogy will, will get something out of it as well. Is that is that my think, hearing that right? That's, yeah, that's exactly right. It, it's just this sort of the blog format and, and the kind of interface that it encourages allows for a broader spectrum of, of individuals in terms of their experience level and interest level. Um, because also another one of the, the great features of putting it into this blog format where you, it allows for comments on each little section. You know, you watch a, a section of the episode and then read the paragraph about our behind-the-scenes work and, and, and the extra links and everything that we, we tie you over to will then also allow for each of those paragraphs you know, um, a comment thread, which uh, genealogists can turn into a, a conversation forum and sort of push back and say, well, oh, yeah, but did you consider going over here or what about this? And you know, it allows for more of a community building base on the blog as well. And those, those amateurs or, you know, the beginners can sort of read through that and, and sort of glean ideas and information from the sort of more experienced genealogists who are posting comments on there as well. Well, I take it that the show was a pretty big success in its first season because what you're describing is really a big commitment, not only of your resources, but of course, going into the future. Um, I know having a website and doing the show and multimedia that that's a lot of work. <laughs> so you guys have really made a commitment here, it sounds like. We have, yeah, definitely. BYU uh, t- Television has made a, a commitment to this this series because uh, and you know, we had the commitment from the very get-go in that it just makes sense being, uh, you know, located here at Brigham Young University and having our connections to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, also Family Search Online. Um, we are obviously uniquely uh, situated to sort of maximize these resources, and so um, it just makes good sense as a television station to, to capitalize on that and, and uh, commit to the series long term. Wow, television has... Uh expanded into a lot more than just episodes, hasn't it? It's it's exactly. a whole multimedia empire. <laughs> and, and it has to be. I mean, our, our motto on Generations and on a couple other shows that are produced is that uh, interactivity is the, is the new entertainment. Uh, and so that's sort of one of our, our mottos uh, that we use in, in deciding what, how, we, how we sort of um, approach the content, no matter what it is, but particularly on Generations Project, how we approach the content in a way that it, it can function across several different uh, media platforms. You know, it's more, we're more into transmedia so that there's a story that happens in the television show itself, but then it should be able to take on a new life when it gets into the blogging experience and then a, a, a new life after that when it gets sort of pushed out and uh, broken down into the social networking platform. Um, each of them, drawing on the original basic content, but then taking on a new sort of identity, a new experience through the interactivity opportunities that are available for those different uh, media. So we're very excited about pushing pushing deeply into those and really capitalizing on what the different uh, media platforms have to offer. Well, I love that. Interactivity is the new entertainment. That is so, that's essentially it, isn't it? Well, but but let's talk about the TV show because we're all waiting with bated breath to get into season two. What? When? when yeah. Okay. Well, so when does season two begin? Well, it begins 2011. Um, sorry to be a little vague about that, but we've we've had a, a little pushback from our programming department, and um, we we don't know exactly when it's going to premiere. BYU Television it has a whole new slate of programming that's coming in 2011. And the decision was just made last Friday uh, to hold off on a premiere of, a, of an entirely new sort of brand and look to BYU Television until a few months into 2011 to make sure we've got everything prepared and all the ducks in a row so we can make an actual big splash. So we were actually hoping for January 2011, but that's not going to happen. So 
sadly, uh, we ha- we've had to push. The, the episodes are uh, for season two are close to being completed, of course, to meet the January deadline. But the viewers will just have to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> we apologize, but we, we believe it will be worth the wait. Well, great. Well, we'll uh, I'll, I'll wait with bated breath for the email that comes through from your offices telling me when I can uh, tell them when it's going to launch. But I do know, like you said, you've already worked on some episodes. And you mentioned in our conversation last year that there may be more of an international aspect to season two. So tell us about that. Did that come to fruition? Uh, absolutely, yeah. This season, uh, we... Uh, it doesn't sound too international, but it, it is. We we went to Canada. I can't even name or number how many times we we went. It was kind of just, all, of course, all by coincidence. We don't know necessarily where the stories will lead. So it was Canada, and then but then out from there, we have stories in Denmark, in Holland, in Germany, and we, we've been developing um, shows in. Uh, we've got shows coming for Thailand, and then into season three, we're going to Poland. Spain, Mexico, Brazil, Japan. So we're definitely pushing outward. Wow. So we're excited about it, especially with season two, the ones that are coming. For example, the, the we have two episodes that take place in Germany. And um, they actually the, the premiere episode of season two takes a husband and wife team, actually, to Germany in search of the uh, bone marrow donor who saved their twin boys, uh, infant boys' lives from a very rare genetic disease. And they decided they came to us and asked for help in locating her and also determining their possible genetic and genealogical uh, relatedness to her. And we, uh, well, I don't want to give too much away. I already have given too much away, but... <laughs> Oh, darn, I was going to try to pull you right in there and give us all the the, the scoop. Quite an emotional adventure ensues. I'll, I'll give you that much. Oh, I can imagine. Well, and it makes the point that there are so many different reasons why we search. It's not just, oh, I just want to find my ancestor. So I love that your stories really get people thinking about all the different kinds of ways in which you may want to go back in time. Exactly. That's one of our, um, you know, in, in the casting process, that's one of the biggest considerations that we have to think about is that we don't sort of fall into a rut of uh, the basic, which is still fine. I don't want to invalidate the basic uh, impetus of, well, how sort of how can I know where I'm going if I don't know where I've come from sort of a question, which is totally valid, but we can't build a TV show on that. And so we intentionally look for as many different angles and approaches and rationales for, for initiating a, a, a generations project as possible. So in season two, we have we have one uh, another one in Germany that asks the question of, of a man is uh, needs to know to what extent his family was involved in um, Nazi Germany, and um, so that that's the beginning of his journey, which takes him in a place he never would have imagined. Uh, I can't say anything, but it's that is quite the journey that he goes on. Another individual, her rationale for wanting to do a generations project is because she feels she's felt in the last two or three years that she sort of had these uh, spiritual promptings, intuitions, impressions from her ancestors, um, almost to the degree where she sort of feels a kinship, like they're almost like a guardian angel over her shoulder. And, uh, but she's sort of afraid that she's crazy uh, because she just, when she says that out loud, she says, Oh, maybe that's, (laughs) a little crazy. And so she came to us and said, help me basically put this to the test. I want to learn about some specific ancestors that I feel have been sort of communicating with me. And then let me see if I'm crazy or not. And that, where that story goes is incredible. Incredible. It's a, it's a great adventure. Oh, I imagine that she's probably not the only one who exactly. occasionally has had that sense. What a fascinating story. Brave of you. I think brave of you and kudos to you guys for going outside the box in terms Thank of you. the stories that you're doing. Um, you're not going into them saying, oh, well, that's not, you know, the right cookie cutter shape. But you're. it sounds like you're just running with it. Oh, absolutely. We, we really try to respect the people, you know, for where they come from. And, and we do know, for example, on that particular episode that, there's, there's so many people, especially genealogists, who 
you know, they just have those in, inexplicable sort of impressions or feelings that, that lead them to, you know, a, a next step in their research that just explodes in terms of information that they never would have thought of, you know, without that little premonition. And so we thought, of course, we have to go down that road and sort of explore what, what could happen and who knew. We didn't know what would happen. Literally, we had no idea. And what came of it is um, really is mind-blowing. <laughs> wow. Maybe you'll give us the answer to all these uh, questions we have about genealogical serendipity. We've all experienced it. Are you going to explain it for us? <laughs> well, we'll at least illustrate it for you. Okay. I don't know if we'll be able to, to answer all the questions, but maybe, you know, by season 10, we'll, maybe we'll arrive at <laughs> some answers. Perfect. But, yeah, we really do try to... Uh, go outside the box and really find uh, as many different sorts of, sorts of um, rationales or, or what we call here, what we call the, the why, helping people find the why, why do a generations project? Because uh, there are just, you know, as many reasons why as there are people on the planet. So um, we'll always pursue all the, the, the variety. Great point. Now, you were talking about that, um, you know, you mentioned that Canada was the first international one. And I can totally see, though, what you're saying, because once you step over the border, it doesn't matter whether it's over the border 10 miles or 10,000 miles, research is completely different when you go into another country. So it very much has that international aspect. What kind of challenges did that pose for you in terms of the research side of things? All sorts of challenges, good challenges, more like opportunities to learn. But, um, you know, you, you name it in terms of language barriers, yeah, cultural barriers. Uh, understanding a whole new sort of set of, of sort of rules and regulations governing uh, public and private records, new interfacing with government institutions, sometimes requiring face-to-face -face interactions rather than, you know, just a simple phone call or an email um, where we've had to fly out numerous times to sort of prove to people that we weren't sort of money-grubbing crazy people. Uh, <laughs> You know, and also just to sort of um, show a, sort of an appreciation for the difference of, of culture and approach to ancestry and, and genealogy that may be different for these different cultures. So especially, for example, in Denmark, that was a, there was a learning curve there, a big learning curve in Germany. Amsterdam was, was fascinating in that they have really, really good records, but really hard to read. <laughs> yeah. Even for the locals. You know, when you start pushing, especially when you start, we were able to push back into the 1600s, 1500s, which is amazing. Not unheard of, but still amazing, and, but uh, required a lot of extra assistance in, in translation and interpolation of, of what the documents were really telling us. You know, we oftentimes say genealogists are some of the most, the nicest people that you'll ever meet. Do you find that that's the case across, around the world? I mean, is that a uh, across culture barriers that uh, when you finally get in touch with the genealogist in a particular country that there seems to be a kinship there? Or do you find that there's some challenges in terms of how they perceive the work that you're doing and, and how they want to participate? Primarily, yeah, we, find, we, we only find, you know, positive uh, reactions and, and get positive interactions from, from genealogists. There is the, the sort of kinship and a sense of um, shared purpose. In you know, be between the two of us, we're all trying to sort of go the same place in terms of just trying to unlock the past right. and sort of put it, put it in a way that we can make sense out of and organize and preserve for future. And so there's that, that, sh that shared, shared purpose that, that brings us together. And, yeah, every once in a while you do run into mm, someone who may have more of a sort of self-protectionist, isolationist mentality uh, that we understand and we, we, we sort, of, sort of can empathize at moments. Uh, with a sense of proprietary interest in, in the information. But um, I, I think once we begin to appeal uh, to them in terms of the individual and how this could help, you know, both the individual that we're searching for and those who will come later, uh, it doesn't take much. And then we're, we're on the same page. And, and uh, yeah, we, we definitely have a, a kinship in terms of a shared purpose. So now you can add diplomatic ambassador to your long list of <laughs> careers. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm headed for the Foreign Service next. Yeah, there you go. Now, I, again, as I mentioned, I was checking out the website, and I noticed there were a couple of sneak peek videos, and I understand that we might be able to get some clips that we will add to the show notes for this interview webpage uh, on the Genealogy Gems podcast. But are there any other 
changes or revisions or new directions in season two in addition to the international aspect? Um, well, in terms of format to the show, if that's what you're asking about, yeah, the, we, were, we were able to make shifts in, in our sort of budget allotments and so on that allow us to spend more time out in the field, which results in more, more time in the field on, on the show. Uh, so sh- actually shorter, shorter in-studio conversations Mm-hmm. Um, we're able to get right down to the most salient questions, which can only be asked in the studio after the fact, you know, after they've gone on this journey, had a month or two to think about it and process, and then we ask them, so does it really change your life? Has it really helped you find answers to your original question of why? And so that's, that's one of the big changes that people will see in the show. We've also coalesced our process and approach to um, the entire series itself to make it more broadly available or accessible to our audience. And what I mean by this is, you know, we, we know that there's a limited amount of people that we can, you know, there's only 13, 12 to 13 people we can have on the show each season. So it's so limited. And, and yet once people do sort of catch the bug, they are inspired and motivated by watching the, the experiences of other people on the show. They want to do it themselves. And so we, in our beginning phases, all we could do to them was say, well, good, good, good. Now go out and f- it's all on the Internet. You'll find it. You'll, you'll, you'll figure it out, which some have. But, but we've, we've gotten a lot of pushback on that. And so um, we've sort of come to a place where we're trying to now um, really, I mean, not to be too, to have too much hubris here, but sort of change the branding and the mentality towards genealogy and family history. No offense to the existing sort of branding, mm-hmm. what we want to do from Generations Project is sort of no longer ask people the question, well, have you done your genealogy? Have you done your family history? Uh, because in some ways that can be intimidating to individuals, as I'm sure you and some of your listeners will, will know, right. that it sounds like, oh my gosh, that's a sea of names and dates and, uh, and you know, basically I'm done mm-hmm. to start to contemplate that. But if we ask individuals, have you done a generation's project, that changes the scenario entirely because what we mean by that is, have you gone through a simple five-step process that has a very specific purpose in mind and a sort of specific uh, outcome intended that will guide you through a research process? And you can do, obviously, we'll do multiple, multiple generations projects and throughout a lifetime. But um, it's, it's more quantifiable. It's more sort of confined. So what we mean by that, have you done your own generations project, is, you know, you need to start out figuring out what, what is your why? What is your motivation for doing this? Do you have a specific question about yourself, about your identity, about your ancestry? So many different, you know, like, like I was saying before, so many different possible reasons why one would do a generations project. But once you found that, then you kind of, get a laser focus on that, that, that why, uh, what your motivation is. And then from there, all you have to start doing is then populate the tree, you know, populate that pedigree chart. So populate the tree, which will, uh, but, but again, following just only the lines that will help you find answers to your why. And then from there, once you've populated the tree sufficiently, then you need to mix it with history. So take those names and dates that are on your pedigree chart mix it with your family history from wherever you can find it, and also with social histories, you know, the, what was going on around the uh, times and places and individuals on your pedigree chart. Then from there, you walk in their shoes. So you find some really tangible ways to walk in those specific ancestors' shoes, whether it's literally flying over to Ireland and walking the path that your ancestor walked down to the down to the very pier where they got on a ship that brought them to America, or simple as finding out that your great-great-grandmother used to bake a rare, rare recipe of banana bread. She could only get bananas once a year, and it filled her home with that aroma, and all the neighbors would come over and share. So you look up a a similar banana bread recipe, bake that, fill your home with that aroma, and you sense, you get a sort of a sensory experience, a physical, visceral experience of what she would have experienced. And then the last step is to share your experience and watch it ripple because that's where it can really bring it back to home for you in terms of when you write it down or when you tell the story to somebody else or you, you blog about it or you do a photo essay. That helps you sort of coalesce and bring it back to, did I find the answers to my why? And then as you watch it ripple, 
you're just amazed by how it impacts other people's lives. So we're, that's where we're, we're pushing right now is to encourage people to do their own generations project. I am once again totally convinced that we're kindred spirits because you're just like singing my song. I am so happy to hear somebody talking this way about genealogy because I think that the old paradigm just doesn't fit anymore. And you're giving them something that's so tangible and so possible to do. I talk about this when and I talk to people about putting together a family history book. You know, don't do the entire history. Right. Pick a story. Just tell that one story and that laser focus and all those things you're talking about. That is, to me, that's the answer to bringing in the non-genealogist into the whole process. Um, that's exciting. Is is that whole process laid out on the website that people can follow along? Yes, it will be. With the launch of the new website, it'll it'll on the right-hand side of the blog, we will have a permanent feature with those five easy steps. And then with, uh, within each step, if you click on them, we'll have further tips and ideas and then also resources to help you accomplish each of those steps. So, for example, the first step being find your why. What is the specific motivation you'll have? You know, is it a particular ancestor or a question about yourself, et cetera, et cetera? We'll actually have a whole huge list of questions that, that sort of a worksheet to sort of like a therapist basically online to help you work <laughs> through these questions and find what, what really is your motivation. Because what we say is, you know, maximize the opportunity. Maybe you won't do another Generations Project for a year or two or five or 20. So... If you really want to get into it now, find the thing that matters most to you right now in your life, and then, of course, you'll be motivated to follow through to the end on this particular generation's project. Um, so anyways, yes, the resources will be there on, on the, the new blog website that, that, to help people walk through it. As well, uh, in second season and all subsequent seasons moving forward, we ha- will have an episode dedicated specifically to just the topic of do your own generations project. And so on that episode, Lisa, the host, and I actually appear on camera, and we we talk about and sort of riff on the five different steps about what what they're all about. We show some examples from the previous season, from earlier episodes, and then it actually gives us an opportunity to follow up with many of the individuals from the previous season. We invited them back into the studio or brought them into the studio by Skype to talk about well, you know, what, what was it like for you? What was the process like for you to find your why? Or how did you feel about going on the hunt to find the names and dates and information to populate your tree? So it's sort of a, a two-fold, hopefully entertaining episode that helps people get even more inspired and informed about how to do their own Generations Project, but then also motivated based on seeing these previous uh, subjects that have been on the show and sort of see where what difference it's made in their life a year after the experience that they had. Well, talking about it as a project rather than doing your family history, exactly. you've just overcome one of the biggest obstacles that, you know, I think most people have when they say, oh, I'm just going to have to do that later. I'll have to wait till I'm retired um, yeah. because you've made it so manageable. And that is really cool that you'll actually devote an episode to really combing through that and helping people think in those terms, you know, bite sized genealogy, something that you can actually do and feel like I came out on the other end with something very tangible. That that is really, really neat. We hope it has that impact. Well, this has, again, just been so much fun. I can't wait to see season two. Um, I assume I'm on your email. You're going to email me when the when the dates are announced, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You'll be one of the first that Mary gets in touch with. Well, fantastic. Kendall, thank you again. Um, It's always so much fun to talk to you. It's very, very clear where (laughs) your heart is in all of this. And I think that comes out so well on the show. And I think that's why people just flock to see it. I saw a lot of people buzzing about the Generations Project online, on blogs, on Facebook. And you're really speaking to them, I think. And, And that's pretty exciting to see. Thank you so much for being a voice for all of us out there on television. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on the show and and for helping to promote the show and your kind, kind words. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much for joining me here on episode 102 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. My big thanks to our special guest, Kendall Wilcox from the Generations Project. Wonderful to chat with him again. And oh, I am looking forward to that new season. Um, They're just going to be expanding it and taking it further. And it's just going to be a lot of fun. Of course, you'll find that on BYU TV. If you have any questions or comments about the show, of course, please do get in touch with me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And uh, coming up in our next episode, I want to give you a little preview. Not only are we going to talk more about the Google book that's coming very soon, but also I want to give you some input and some step-by-step ideas about how to work with the new, brand new launched Google 6.0. Yes, Google 6.0 is out, came out a couple of weeks ago. There are some fairly big changes to it, and we're going to be covering all of that in the next episode. So I certainly hope you'll join me back here to tune into that. Until then, I wish you a very Merry Christmas for you and your family and a Happy New Year. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.